All right. Let's get started. Uh, welcome to the session on exception handling and functional and reactive programming. My name is Venkat Subramanyam. We're going to talk about uh, some of the issues with how we can deal with exceptions. Uh, one of the reasons I uh, created this talk is uh, this is a very often asked question among developers. How do we really deal with exceptions when it com comes to functional programming? So that's one of the things I want to focus on today. And along the way, I'll talk a little bit about reactive programming as well. Well, first of all, functional programming has been uh, in existence for a long time, but uh, since Java 8, we have been able to do functional programming in Java as well, which is pretty exciting. But what does it really mean to be able to program in functional style? So fundamentally, I'll start with a little example just to illustrate the point here. Suppose I have a list of numbers. Let's say we have a bunch of numbers given to us like so, and I want to be able to, let's say, take these collection of numbers so I could potentially you know, turn that into a stream in Java. And then I can perform a filter operation where, given an element, I can get all the even numbers from that particular collection. Then I can perform a transformation or a map operation where I can double the values, for example, and then I can take each of the elements and I can simply print it, and I say print line, and I can, of course, print out the values in that particular collection. So this basically is what we know as the functional pipeline or a functional composition. So the data flows through the pipeline, and of course, we are getting the results 4, 8, and 12, which is the double of the even numbers in this collection, but that's nicely flowing through these filter operations and the map operation, and then we are printing it out. So that becomes the functional pipeline or the functional composition. We have all definitely enjoyed writing code like this. One of the reasons I really enjoy this functional style is that it removes accidental complexity from the code compared to the imperative style of programming. The code flows like the problem statement. It is easier to understand, easier to read, easier to change. So a lot of nice benefits we get from having the functional pipeline. Line. Now, one of the characteristics of functional programming also is lazy evaluation. Lazy evaluation gives us efficiency in the code, so we are not co creating collection after collection after collection. Instead, it just simply flows through but only executes functions on demand or on necessary necessity, and that's really a good thing. Now, of course, there's also reactive programming. And I, when I started reading about reactive programming, I got really frustrated because there was a lot of talk about what this is and what that is, but I am like show me the code kind of a person. And, and call me silly, but I get excited about you know, things when it kind of you know, occurs uh, in, in a way that it makes sense. And then it jumped out of me one day and I said to myself, oh my gosh, functional programming is really, uh, uh, reactive programming is really functional programming plus plus. And, and the reason I say it's functional programming plus plus is in reactive programming, we build on a higher level of abstraction, but really from the same concepts of functional pipeline, lazy evaluation, all those things still exist. Just to entertain this thought for a minute about why I believe that reactive programming is functional programming plus plus, Let's take a look at a little example here. This obviously we know is a functional pipeline. That's what we are dealing with. But I'm going to change this just a little bit in here to say in this case io.reactive, let's say uh, x.star, and I'm going to come down to this code, and I'm going to change only uh, two lines of code in here, if you will. The first thing I'm going to change here is uh, rather than saying list off, I'm going to simply say in this case, let's say uh, a flow flowable dot from eta rubble, and I'm going to ask it to give me a reactive pipeline rather than a functional stream pipeline. That's the very first change I made right there. Then I'm going to simply take this one and call subscribe instead of calling the for each and execute the code right here with the reactive uh, pipeline. So what you're going to see in this particular case is you are going to have pretty much the same idea, the stream concept right here. So from iterable is going to give you a, a reactive stream on the pipeline. And then once you get the reactive stream, it's exactly the same filter, exactly the same map that you are calling in terms of the functions. But you're calling the you know, subscribe function right here. And the subscribe function is going to receive the data, and it's going to help you to print it. So that gives you an idea how similar 
those two are uh, in concept, if you will, in this particular case. I'm making a mistake in the import, obviously, here. So essentially, the idea is simply the same in terms of what you provide, and, and you can build on those concepts. But given this, of course, that they are so similar to each other, what does it really mean to deal with exceptions? So now let's talk about exception handling uh, before we go any further. Now, let's, let's really step back a minute and think about it. And I sincerely believe that we as humans, the, the, the world of humans, haven't still figured out how to deal with errors in general. Uh, some of you are probably very young. You probably don't remember the you know, past as much because you may not have suffered through it. Some of us are a little older. We have been through that and, and uh, you know, been burned by some of these things. So way back in time, we used to return errors from functions. And unfortunately, when you return error from function, then the question is, how do you deal with data? So there is a bit of a conflict between returning data versus returning error. So then people said, well, maybe we'll return an error code, and maybe the data can be returned as a reference. So you send a little pointer to a memory area, you fill the data, and then you return the data, and the error code is zero if everything went well. Otherwise, you get a little error code. Well, that really didn't help us to program really well. Some of you may remember common core bar days of programming, where you have these SOK or H results, and that really, really becomes horrible. Then eventually, we discovered we could throw exceptions from code. Now, I feel that this is not the best option, but that's the best we got so far. And, and so when something goes wrong, we throw exception. My first complaint is they shouldn't have called it exception to begin with. They could have called it normal, because stuff happens, right? And that's a matter of fact of life. So we call it exception, and then we kind of get excited when that happens. But stuff happens. Things fail, and you want to handle that, that is natural. So when it comes to exception handling, the question is, how do you handle it? And before we even go about it, I, I want to make one you know, uh, statement here, and that is uh, exception handling is an imperative style of programming idea. So I want to really emphasize that, is that exception handling is purely an imperative style of programming idea. And I want to go to the extent to say that functional programming and exception handling are mutually exclusive. So I want to really emphasize that as well to say that functional programming and exception handling are really mutually exclusive. So when it comes to functional programming, you don't want to deal with exceptions. Hope that was a useful session. Thank you so much for coming. Well, so the... <laughs> Well, the idea basically is you can't really deal with this. So the point really is I read about this person who was uh, smoking in the back of a truck. You know what? I'm not going to make any judgments. It's perfectly fine. It's her right to smoke. Uh, there was also a story of the person having a gasoline tank in the back of a truck. Nothing really wrong. But it happened to be the same person who had the gasoline tank and was smoking in the back of the truck. I don't want to go any further. You know how it ended up really badly for that person and the truck. The point really is that some things are not going to go to well with each other, and we need to recognize that. But that doesn't mean we can just go home ignoring the problem. What do we do with it? So let's think about this with a little example, and we can play with it. Let's start with a little bit of an imperative style code and see where we can go with it. So I'm going to start with a little uh, code here for, let's say, an airport, let's say, code. And as you can see, I can write code really fast. So right there is a function called get name of airport. Well, the get name of airport takes a code for an airport, goes to a web service, makes a request, gets the name of the airport, and then returns it. Now, obviously, if something were to go wrong, it's going to throw an I.O. exception, or it's going to throw a URL syntax exception in this particular case. It also opens with a try and closes that resource for us uh, at, at the necessary time. So all that looks really reasonable. Let's go over here and 
take a bunch of airports for a minute and let's say we got a bunch of airports down in Texas and I want to be able to know what the names of each of these airports are. Well, we all know exactly how to write a fun you know, imperative style code for a task like this, right? So I can say for IATA code and, and that comes from the IATA codes, if you will. And I'm going to simply say in here, well, output, let's say, get name of the airport for the IATA code that I have with me, and I can call that function so easily, right? So it's a fairly trivial piece of code. But of course, the compiler is going to tell us, hey, hey, you got to do a few things in here. Well, the first thing the compiler is telling me is that I better bring in some imports. So I'm going to say I'm bringing the I.O., I'm bringing the net. Then I look at the compiler. It tells me I need to handle the I.O. exception. So it says you need to either throw the I.O. exception or you got to catch it. Well, pretty reasonable, isn't it? So we can quickly do that uh, in the code. And imperative style code is really good at taking care of these things. So I'm going to say exception EX. And then what do I want to do? Maybe I want to really print out exception dot get message and say what actually went wrong. So I can run this code. Maybe I want to print the data in uppercase after all. So I can even say dot to uppercase like so. And I can just print that result out if it is going to work. So as you can see, it produces the result for those. We see a bunch of airport names. So that worked really well. So you don't even think about it. You're used to it. It's very common. That's life in the big city. We all written, written code like this. And when the compiler complains, uh, you know, that exception to be handled, we normally put an empty catch block and keep going. So that's all great, right? It's not a problem. But of course, you can also do whatever is appropriate and print the message. That works really well also. But what if I were to say an existing, uh, an airport that doesn't exist, like a TAS as an airport name? Well, the code need, no, need, you know, knows what to do with it. So when you look at the output, you can see it says invalid airport code or TAS, so it handles the exception uh, 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 as well and prints the details appropriately. So right there is an imperative style code, but before we go any further, I think everyone in this room can agree to one thing. It doesn't matter what style of programming you use, the output should be exactly the same as the input is for a given problem. You cannot tell your customers, I refactored the code into functional style. It's so awesome, but it won't do what you expect to do. They're not going to buy the product. They're not going to accept it. So no matter whether you use imperative style or functional style, the behavior of the code should exactly be the same when we are done with such refactoring to uh, functional style from imperative style of programming. So the question is, how do we we change this code into a functional style code now? That's the question. So let's talk about how do we convert this code into a functional style code. But before we go dive into the depth of the problem really quickly, let's take uh, the tour to something a little bit more easier, if you will. So let's take a look at how a functional style code is going to look beautiful, innocent, uh, you know, nice and cute and all that. So I'm I'm going to say IATA codes dot stream, so we get a stream API from it, dot for each system dot out, and you want to print it, and I can say print line, and that becomes a functional style to print the uh, code. And, and silly, but I'm going to try to take this and say string, and I'm going to convert it to an uppercase as well, and you can see that's really easy as well, as you can see. And if I really wanted to, I could put a filter here also. But I don't want to be printing the airport uh, you know, uh, codes after all. I want to print in uppercase the names of the airport. So what am I going to do? I'm going to say dot map, and I'm going to say IATA code, and I'll call the get name for IATA code, and I want to call that particular method and perform the map operation. 
every one of us who has written functional style code knows that's basically what's going to be the code to take an imperative style code and turn into an equivalent functional code, functional style code, so that looks pretty you know, convincing, isn't it? But the minute you write this code, what's going to happen? The compiler is going to tell us, you have an unreported exception, IO exception must be caught or must be declared to be thrown. And that's from line number 25. And you, the first time you run the, across this exception, what do you say? You say, huh, so it wants me to handle the exception, right? And of course, you may be tempted to say, put a try right there and put a little you know, catch over here, if you will. And of course, you can say catch the exception, uh, ex, and then you can simply say output exception.get message. And, and now you're like, great, what does the compiler tell us now? And you look at the compiler, it repeats the same damn message again. There is no empathy, right? It didn't even say, you know, thanks for your effort, right? Something like that would have been nice. Good, good job, you tried at least, my friend, but still you have the problem, right? It just repeats the same message, except the line number is 26 instead of 25. That, that just feels really harsh, isn't it? With all that effort you put in, and then you're like, huh, why doesn't that work? And you take a look at it, and that's line number 26 right there. So the problem is not in the main function. The problem is when it talks about the, the function it is talking about, what it's talking about is that function, that lambda expression that you see right there. So it's telling us that that highlighted lambda expression either needs to handle the exception or needs to throw. The good news is there's no way to tell it should throw, right? So the question is, how do we handle that exception? And you're probably sitting and staring at this for a few minutes and you're telling yourselves, all right, that did not work. So stepping back to what we had, line number 25 again, with the problem, what do we do? And you probably are thinking, well, the problem is your enemy right now is the compiler, isn't it? So generally, programmers will look and say, oh, that stupid compiler doesn't want to let my code compile. And then you think about this and say, aha, I know how to shut the compiler down. So some people are very creative, right? So they come down here and they say, you know what, I am not going to throw those exceptions anymore. And instead, I'm going to say try right there, and I'm going to come down to the end of that particular function, uh, and we'll say catch exception and ex, and then beautifully we can say throw new runtime exception, and you can bundle this to exception. Raise your hand if you've ever seen anyone do this. Yeah, absolutely, right? When I see that code, I usually curl up in a corner and cry for 15 minutes, and then wipe my tears and come back and refactor the code. Now, why is this a terrible idea? The terrible idea here is we are just keen on shutting this compiler down. So when you write this code and you look at this code, what's going to happen is it runs and produces the result. And you're like, yay, this is great. Well, not really. The problem here is if you go back to this code right now, and if you have an invalid airport code, what's going to happen? Well, when you run that code, obviously, this time, you notice the output is that, right? That's not going to be really a lot of fun. It blows the stack on you. And of course, you say, gosh, if it blows the stack, I need to handle it. So I can put a try again on this one, right? And then you can say a catch exception. And then you can try to put an exception right here. And of course, in this case, I want to output the exception, get message. Now, when I do this, of course, you can look at the output of this code, and you notice that it failed, but it never gave us the airports after that. And this only gets worse if somebody on a fateful day comes and turns this into a parallel stream. That's going to get even worse, because now you don't know when it's going to fail and, and what threat is going to cause that. And in this case, it produced an Antonio, but there's no guarantee, obviously, because it might be failing at any time. As you can see, there's no San Antonio on this output. I can run again, and you can see that it actually produces different results, and there's no guarantee when it's going to fail at any given time. So that, uh, there, you, well, th th as you can see, the behavior is quite unpredictable in terms of the output of that code. We cannot simply say what's happening. 
Now, before I go one more step further, I want to just tell one thing about this before we go. Back to this exception, uh, when you look at this code, uh, you would notice that you got the compilation error, and notice it says unsupported exception must be caught or must be thrown. Now, one of the things that people often end up complaining is, they complain to say that, oh my gosh, map is stupid. If it only took an interface that were to throw an exception, uh, then this wouldn't be a problem because that exception would be caught and then we can handle it elsewhere. And I'm not exaggerating when I say this. I seriously got an email from a person and the email said this, hey Venkat, you know that map and filter and functions like that do not take interfaces that can support exception and look at consumer, look at uh, you know, predicate, look at function. So I forked the code for the JDK, and I completely changed everything to interfaces now can handle exception, can you do a code review for me? And I replied to the person saying, yes, I can, but I need answer to one question from you. If you can fork it, and you can change it so quickly, I think the people who wrote this API in Oracle can be faster in forking and changing that can you tell me why maybe they didn't do it? And that is the question we need to really understand. Why don't these functions really throw exception? And, and that really comes down to, again, emphasizing that functional handling and exception handling, functional programming and exception handling are mutually exclusive. I hope now you'll get the message and you can leave. We are done with the talk. No, we still need to handle exception at the end of the day, right? So what are we going to do about it? And to answer that question, we clearly are not able to deal with the exception right here. So what are we going to do to uh, you know, deal with this particular problem? How do we work with this code in a way we can handle the exception uh, properly? Especially when we have an airport that might be invalid as well. So we are back to square one. We got a piece of code with exception. We don't want to throw a runtime exception. We don't want to go through a massive process of creating classes that will convert a function into a function that throws exception. People have devised all kinds of solution, but unfortunately, every one of them doesn't directly address the problem. So how do we solve this particular problem? Well, typically, I'm, I'm really excited about giving analogies from the world out there when I teach programming uh, courses or teach uh, you know, uh, programming talks. But this was nature in reverse. I ended up actually using something from programming in the world out there. So this happened back right before the pandemic, and I was speaking at the New England Java user group, amazing group in Boston, and uh, the next morning, I was going to speak in Montreal, and it was a flight early in the morning. I was going to take a 6.30 a.m. flight, arrive there at 8 o'clock, go give the talk. So I'm like, yes, Canada is a neighboring country, but I'm a you know, experienced traveler. I don't need to really prepare too much, or so I told myself. I had a great time at the user group, finished my talks, hang around with the group. Right about 11-ish in the night, I came back to the hotel, and I said to myself, I'll leave at 4 in the morning. I'll get to the hotel. I'll take the flight. No big deal. Well, at 4 in the morning, I got up. I started driving to the airport. It had snowed really well that night, so the entire road was covered with snow. As I started driving towards the airport, I heard a little thump, and the next thing you know, the car is not moving so smoothly. And remember, this is about 4.15 in the morning, or in the night, if you want to call it that way. And I stopped the car in the middle of the road, got out, took a look at the car. The front right tire was completely busted. So I went back, sat down in the car, and I'm like, gosh, what do I do? I need to go to the airport. I got a flight in about, you know, about two hours. I need to get there really quickly. And, and then I found a phone number for the support from the rental car company. So I called them. And, the, and, the, and the, when I called it, it said, uh, thank you for calling. Your call is important to us. That means nobody cares. So essentially, I'm stuck in the road at 4 in the morning. And they said, somebody will attend to you in about two and a half hours. Like, that's not going to cut it. I've got to go to the airport. I got to take this flight. I got to talk to give. 
And I was seriously, this is the thought that was going through my mind. I'm sitting alone, completely helpless, in the middle of a road with nobody around. And I kind of, my thought wandered away. And I, suddenly it occurred to me, seriously, if you don't believe it, uh, I said to myself, what would you do when exception strikes you in functional programming? And immediately I said to myself, you deal with it down the stream. Seriously, this is the word that came to my mind, and that is deal with it uh, downstream. So in other words, if a good friend of yours calls you and says, I'm in the middle of the freeway, I've got a flat tire, what do I do? Here's the worst advice you will give your friend if you don't want this person to be a friend anymore. You would tell them, put the car in reverse and start driving back on the freeway. That's not what you would tell anyone, right? That's inhumane. You would tell them, be careful, keep moving forward, exit the freeway, pull to the shoulder, and get out. And, and, and I, I said to this to myself, deal with it downstream. Those you know, four words or five words truly gave me some new energy. I turned on the ignition, put my foot to the pedal, and I drove all the way to the airport. And as I entered to the airport into the, in, into the rental car facility, the people, the few people working there that early morning saw this huge noise rolling in. And, and one person came to me and said, are you okay? I said, no, I'm just perfectly fine. It's just the car, I think it's got flat tire, but here's the key and I ran away. And, and, and about a month later, I was in another country. My wife called me and said, remember you said you had this problem in Boston? I said, yeah, that's right. And she said, I got the bill. I'm like, let me sit down before I hear you. And she said, they charged me $65, I can handle that. So the point really is deal with it downstream. So what that means is you don't have the luxury of throwing exceptions in a functional pipeline. So I want you to think about this as a pipeline, which is what you have right here as a pipeline. And you're in the middle of the pipeline, if you have an exception, you don't want to blow up your pipeline and then exit. Because in a functional programming, unlike an imperative style of programming, you don't have the stack the same way as you do in an imperative style of programming. In an imperative style, you call a function which calls a function which calls a function, and you have the luxury of throwing your exception back to a caller to handle it. Well, there is no sequence of caller waiting to handle stuff in a functional pipeline because you're facing forward. You don't care about where you came from. You are very keen on where you're headed. So when you have this functional pipeline, you cannot blow up in the middle of a pipeline and say, gosh, I have an exception. I'm going to blow up the stack. Well, what happens to all the data you're processing? What happens to the computation you did so far? What happens to so many other things? That's simply simply doesn't make any sense. So what do we do? So the answer to that question is, notice that the function is exactly the same as we started with earlier. It throws the IO exception, throws the uh, URI syntax exception. It may even throw a runtime exception. It doesn't really matter. But the bottom line is, if a function throws an exception, don't call it directly from your functional pipeline. Whether the compiler you know, tells you or not, that's not the right thing to do. So what should we be really doing? So the very first thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to say a public static. I'm going to say a try string. I'll come back to that in a minute. And I'm going to say try get name uh, for airport. And I'm going to say string IATA code. And I'm going to start with that particular function. So I'm calling a function called try get name of airport. So what does a try get name of airport do? It's returning something called a try. So what is a try? You probably have seen this in other libraries, other languages. If you're programmed in Scala, you probably know about try from Scala. Similarly, if you're programmed using libraries like Waver, you have similar concepts available in those libraries. You can use them if you're already using those libraries, or you can make one yourselves very quickly. Not really hard at all if we understand what we are doing. So the point really is the following, a treat 
errors as a form of data, that is one of the most important things for us to keep in mind. So treat error as a form of data. So when something goes wrong, don't deal with it as an exception. Instead you say, exception is just another form of data. So there are data that tells me, here's the information you wanted. There's also data that says something went wrong. But metaphorically speaking, I think you would agree with it. Throwing exception is pretty rude. Who in this room likes things thrown at them? This is much more polite and civilized. It says, I'm sorry something went wrong, here you go. And it hands you an error rather than throwing things at you. So very civilized, very pro you know, professional way of writing code as well. So when something goes wrong, capture the data into a union object. So the union object, that's exactly what it is. It's a union object. You know optional may be empty or optional may have data. Think of this as a slightly different optional. This is a data that may exist in the try or an error may exist in the try. That's basically what a try is. So I've got a callable. And have you ever wondered uh, this? This is kind of, you know, uh, something I sometimes, you know, think about. We already had callable in Java. Then we have a supplier as well. Now you kind of wonder why did they go to the extent of creating supplier in when, when they started creating functional API. And the reason is callable deals with exception and supplier deals with no exception. That's really the difference between the two in interfaces, if you will. So uh, if you don't want to deal with exceptions, supplier is useful to get an object. But if you uh, want to deal with exceptions, you already have callable in Java from the times of Java 5, isn't it? So we have the callable, and I bring in a function as well in here, and I'm going to say, here comes an interface called try. And I made this a sealed interface. It, it doesn't have to be, but now that we have sealed in Java, we can make use of it. So I create a sealed interface called a try, which permits only two children, which is success and failure. As you can imagine, Success is a try that contains data. Failure is a try that contains the error. So that's the union object. Rather than polluting one object with both things, we can create two separate things, a success and a failure, both of which are really implementing the try interface. Then I have a get result, which is an abstract function. I have a get error, which is an abstract function as well. You can get the error if there is an error. You can get the result if there is a result from it as well. Well, then I have a function called off. I mentioned earlier about optional. So in the spirit of optional off, I'm creating a try off. So try off call call callable, and I present a callable, a block of code I'm going to call. As you know, that callable may succeed or it may fail. If it succeeds, I want a success. If it fails, I want a failure. So essentially, I put a try block. And of course, I say, return new success, the result of callable's call method. Hey, everything worked. Great. Take the data wrap it into success, and return it. Whoops, something failed, I got an exception, what should I do? Wrap that exception throwable into a failure and return it. So as you can see, this simply is returning a off in this case, and we are either getting the data or we are getting the exception, which we're going to be returning from this, as you can see. In a similar way, there is one other problem, though. In a functional pipeline, as you are transforming data, you no longer are pushing the data downstream. So if you think of the functional pipeline, if at any time something goes wrong, you're going to be sending the data or you're going to send the error, but both are going to move forward as a try. So think of it as a capsule that's going to hold the data or the error, and you want to push that capsule down the stream, which means you may have to do more operations on it along the way. So we have a map function we are creating. The map function says, give me a function I want to call. Once again, you may be calling this on a good object, a success, or you may call this on a failure. Well, what do you do if it's a failure? Again, we can be inspired by the map operation of optional. If the optional is empty, 
map simply forwards the empty with a different type forward. If the map contains a data, only then it applies the function. Same concept I'm applying here. If this is an instance of success, or if it is not, what do I want to do? If it's an instance of success, call the function given and take that result and return a try. Remember, it may succeed or it may fail as well. If it succeeds, you return a success. If it fails, you return a failure from it as well. Then, of course, in the case of a failure, you simply return the failure forward at this particular point. So that's basically the map function. So all we have is two functions in the try, an off functions, which is a factory to create a success or a failure, a map function, which knows to transform a try into either a success or to a failure based on applying a function. So now that we have the try, you know the two other things we need here is the, is the success, of course, and then we also need the uh, failure class as well. So the success implements the try, and it simply says, here is the result that was given to me. I'm going to store it right there. And in the success, I receive it. And of course, the get result simply returns the result back to the caller. And the get error simply says, sorry, I've not been implemented. Likewise, if you look at the failure, it holds the throwable given to it. It simply, in the get result, says, I'm not implemented. But the get uh, error returns the throwable back to the caller. So all we have right now is a try, a success, and a failure are the three things we have with us. So what are we going to do now? What I can then do here is I can go back to this code and say return try off, and we can simply say take the get name of airport and pass the IATA code to it and simply return that as a try. So if you have any function that were to throw an exception, all you have to do is to write a wrapper function that will call that intended function and return a try, either a success or a failure, back to you. OK, so far, so good. How do we go about using the code we just wrote uh, in here to do any more work? So let's get rid of all of that for a minute. We'll get to that in just a minute to see how we can use it. So we go back to the uh, stream API. We'll start with the for each, and we will do a system.out uh, print line, and we will uh, work our way uh, through it again to see how we can implement it. So we got the IATA codes right now in our functional stream. So what's the next thing I want to do? I want to take the perform the operation of map. And I'm going to say in here, given the IATA code that's been given to me, call the try uh, get name of airport. So I want to call that function try get name of airport and pass the IATA code to it. So that's my very first step in this, in this mapping, used to perform the transformation of the data. As you would expect in this particular case, the result of this operation is going to be a success, 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 and a failure, and a success. Because if there was a successful operation, you got a success object back. If the result was a failure, you got a failure back. So you can see for Austin and Houston and Dallas-Fort Worth, you got success, success, success. The, for the TAS, which is not a valid airport code, you got a failure. And then SAT, you got a success as well for San Antonio. So that performed the operation. You got a success or a failure back at but, but your site. But then, remember, we don't want the airport names. We want them in uppercase of airport names. So I'm going to do a map operation right there. And in this case, I'm going to say, given a try, we'll call it as a result. What do I want to do? Result.map. So I'm going to call a map function. And I want to perform the transformation when I call the map function. Now remember, the result is a success or a failure, as you saw. 
Three successes, one failure, one success in the example we saw. So if it's a success, the map will apply the function you provide. If it's a failure, the map will not call the function. It's a failure, there's nothing to work with. It simply returns the failure, but transforms the type in this particular case to whatever type of the function it would be. So in this case, what I'm gonna do is to simply say a dot name, and in this case, I'm gonna say a name dot two string, and I can call the two string, uh, two uppercase rather, to uppercase, and I can ask it to transform to an uppercase. So, so as a result, once again, uh, you can see the results are a success, and success, and success, and failure, and success as well. So again, you won't see the difference here, but the first one was a success of the airport name. The second is a success of the airport name in uppercase. That's where we are headed. But before we even go any further, if you're really interested, you could really take a stab at it, and you can even make this a little bit more concise if you care for. And in this case, we can simply say, I, I want to really take the you know, try a uh, get name for airport, and I wanna just pass that down there in this particular call, and, and similarly you can say, uh, maybe I can just take a little bit of an effort here as well, and simply say this is a string uh, to uppercase, so you can start nicely using method references in here as well, so that makes the code a little bit more concise in, the, in terms of how you're handling it. So as a result, we took the airport codes, transformed to the names of the airport, took the names of the airport, transformed them to uppercase in here as well, and then of course we are printing the result. But obviously in this particular case, as you know, you're not interested in printing success or failure, you really want the data that you're looking for, how do you really get it? So, and the answer to that question is, you perform a, a, a transformation again here, and you can say result, once again, this is where, you know, sometimes people wonder, why does Java keep moving forward? Well, when Java moves forward, we tend to write more intelligent code, which is more concise and easy to read, easy to work with, and we can leverage those things. And, and here is a clear case where you really need an expression here, absolutely, right? Because what you want to do is to return a result of an expression. And I'm so thankful that switch now is an expression. So you can use a switch expression right here, and you can say, on the result, I want to do the processing, and what am I going to say here? If the case is a success, and I got a, a success in this case, I have the data, I want to simply return the data dot get result. Why, how, why do I call get result? Because as you can see here, get result is the abstract method that gives me the result of this particular call. So I can say get result, I can get the data from the result. Or, or you can say in this case a result uh, and or, or, uh, you know whatever you want to call it and you can get the data from there. Similarly, you can say if it is a failure in this case and you have an error error, what do you want to do? Well, if it's an error, you want to get the get error after all. So I can say error.get error, and I can get the error detail from there as well, and I can then return that error detail like so. So that becomes a nice concise way of in the whenever you want to excuse me, extract the data or extract the error, you can keep that all the way to the edge, and in the edge you can get the data or the result as the case may be. And then finally, in the very last step, you can simply print the data out as you can see right there. So now you can see it's producing the result of the airports when it's valid, and if the airport is not valid, it gives us the result, and in the end, of course, we get the result for the other operation as well. But the good news is it doesn't matter whether you do this sequentially or in parallel because we are not blowing up in the functional stream. You are catching the exception and then treating the error as a form of data. And that is one of the key things to keep in mind is when you're writing functional style code, you want to wrap the data as a, a exception as an error, an error as a data, 
and then push it down this uh, pipeline. Now, good news and bad news. What's the good news? The good news is we got a fairly civilized way of handling the problem. We have a nice way to deal with the exception and deal with the data. So we are not blowing the stack anywhere we wanted to. We're not trying to convert checked exceptions to unchecked exceptions. We are dealing with exceptions as they are in the application, whether they are checked or unchecked, that's a good news. But the downside to this code, though, is I would argue the code is not as simple as it once was because every step of the pipeline will have to deal with data and the exception. So what is the downside? You, one thing I want to emphasize is we can never have a solution that is perfect. If somebody says this per solution is the best solution ever, it's perfect. They drank the Kool-Aid and they cannot see beyond the, the fantasies they have. Similarly, if somebody says this sucks and there's nothing good about it, that's called a bias. There's always pros and cons to everything we look at. So what is the pro here? The good news is we got a nice way to deal with exception. We can treat it as an error. We can push it down the stream. What's the got you? The catch is the code now is, uh, you know, uh, the code now is less cohesive than, uh, than it was before. That is one of the biggest downsides to this particular design. Because when you look at the functional pipeline, that cuteness doesn't exist anymore. Because every step of the pipeline says, are you data, are you error? Are you data, are you error? So the code is not very cohesive. That's one of the downsides to this particular solution that you have to deal with here. That is probably one of the gotchas. So that shows us how we are able to handle this in the functional pipeline. Now, what about Reactive Stream API? How does Reactive Stream API deal with it? Remember I mentioned that reactive programming is really functional programming plus plus. So the idea of treating error as data is still the same that you want to think about. Except depending on the functional, sorry, reactive stream API that you use, you might see some variations. One of them is, if you want to take this approach in the reactive pipeline, you certainly can do that. Nothing stops you from doing it. So when you're programming in reactive streams, you can take your map function and pass the try down the chain. You can then transform the map and you can do exactly the same in reactive programming if you really wanted to do because the model is simply built on top of functional style so that idea carries through really well. But however, if you look at the Rx Java kind of libraries, they do something a little bit differently. And what they do is, when you are in the functional pipeline, so you have a, a stream, I'll call it as a reactive stream, and, and you call a map maybe, you call a filter maybe, you call a map again, and then you call a subscribe uh, at the very end. So what the reactive stream library does is a little bit different by default. If you choose not to go the route of using the try, success, and failure, if any of these steps were to create an exception, unlike the Java stream API, the map function, the filter function in the reactive stream uh, takes uh, interfaces that support uh, exceptions. So this is really a different API under the hood, it can take an interface that supports exceptions. But the qu question is why? And the reason is the functions like map and filter, what they do is they provide in the subscribe, you deal with actually what's called three channels. So this is the reactive stream API has three channels. The first channel is the data channel. The second channel that you have in here is called the error channel, and then the last one that you have in here is called the complete channel. So the way the Reactive Stream API works is it pushes the data through the data channel one at a time as it's moving through. If any of these steps were to fail, it closes the data channel and sends one signal through the error channel. So it literally sends the exception as a form of data 
through the error channel. So the data channel is closed, the error channel gets the error. So when you go back to the subscribe function, here you say data, and this is the data channel. You handle the data like so right there. So this is your data channel that I mentioned. Then you say a comma, an error, and you can say handle error, and here comes the error channel. So this is the you know, endpoint of the data channel that I mentioned about. This is the endpoint of the error channel. And then finally, you also have maybe a done function you can call, and, and that really bec becomes your complete channel that I was mentioning to, alluding to. So the reactive stream API is a little bit different. Again, to emphasize, you can still do what we did earlier in functional pipeline. You can do that in reactive stream also. However, reactive stream gives you one other alternative, and that is any of the steps in the pipeline, if the exception were to happen, it then takes the exception, closes the data channel, sends the exception as a form of data through the error channel, and you get it on this site. The good news is the functions in the pipeline are very cohesive. You only have to deal with data. You don't have to worry about the error. That's the good news. The bad news is if a failure were to happen, you bypass everything else, and the error is delivered to you, and the stream terminates at that point. So no more processing happens at that particular point. So there's a good news and a bad news here in terms of what the API can do for you. So you gain some, you lose some. So there is no perfect solution for this, but some takeaways I want to emphasize are these. First and foremost, exception handling is an imperative style of programming idea. Please don't throw exceptions in functional style code. It makes your code dysfunctional. Don't do that. Secondly, functional programming and exception handling are mutually exclusive. You cannot be dealing with exception the same way. Deal with the error downstream. Treat error as a form of data and push it down, you compromise a bit because the code is not as cohesive as it once was, but there's a better civilized way to handle errors and exceptions. Hope that was useful. Thank you so much for coming.